Hello everyone, welcome back to class. This is the Liberated Sinner channel. And today we're gonna to be tackling God 100. Now this is a very basic class, but it's something we have to cover, something we have to talk about. Without the conversation, without the talk about God, Everything in the Judeo-Christian religion is pretty much non-starter. If you can't establish God, if you can't have the, again, the conversation about God, there is really nothing to talk about because uh, he is the central part, the central theme of the Judeo-Christian religion. So we're going to dig through scripture to see what it says about him, his characteristics, who he is, who he isn't, which I'm actually going to do in a separate class kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit, answering some of those um, those questions uh, that the world asks or the things that the, the world says about God. Um, but we're going to jump into scripture and find out what it says about him. But first, I want to ask you a question. What do you think when you hear the term God? You see, we typically have these, there's all kinds of ideas theories about who he is, what he looks like, what he does, etc., etc. And we have these preconceived notions and ideas about about all this. And sometimes we can impose those ideas on God. And a lot of times they're false. Uh, we impose this false idea of God and we have this assumption that God is this way based upon, you know, our own childhood or our own upbringing. So we have to, digging into psychology a little bit, we have to dig into kind of our own lives and do some soul searching about why we have the idea we do about God. And we typically get our ideas of God from our childhood, from the adults, you know, um, when we were younger, maybe at your church when you were younger, typically from your parents, and especially from our fathers. Because when you think about it, when you're a kid, you're this tiny little human being and your dad and your mom and the other adults are these gigantic individuals who are strong, intelligent, and they have all these almost otherworldly powers and abilities, things that you simply can't do. So when you're that kid, yeah, it, they look like gods. Um, so that can transform into a false idea of God. And more specifically, so for instance, if your dad is or was uh, this angry, fearful individual, God can become an angry, fearful individual. If your dad was this absent, never around, didn't really care about you individual, God can become that. And likewise, if your dad was uh, loving, caring, supportive, God can become that. So again, in a good and bad way, this can be imposed upon God. But you kind of want to, I don't want to say erase it, but you will, you will at least want to understand why you have the, the thought process you do. Um, and then kind of look at scripture and see what scripture says, says about God himself. Uh, so we're going to dig into that. Um, but before that, one more thing before we dig into scripture with uh, his characteristics. Is there something I want you to be? And that thing is, I want you to be a Berean. And this is actually something I, I think every believer should be. We're going to jump into scripture to look at what a Berean is. So we're going to jump into Acts 17. 10. And I'm going to have scripture up for us to read together here. I'll, I'll have it highlighted or underlined um, so you know where I'm at. Um, but we're in Acts 17, 10. I'll read it and then I'll kind of break it down a little bit. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were fair-minded, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily 
to find out whether these things were so. So, just to recap of kind of what happened. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most, two-thirds or so, of the New Testament, very famous pastor. Everyone knows who Paul is. He's probably the, maybe the, the, the most famous person in the New Testament other than Jesus. So he preaches a sermon to these people at Berea. And he goes away and comes back. And to, I guess, to some of his, maybe his surprise, he realizes that these Bereans have, have searched the scriptures and wanted to find out if what Paul was saying was true. If what he was saying was backed up by the, the scripture they had. He wasn't mad at them. He actually commended them for it. And the, the cool thing is it says um, down here in, in verse 4, they searched the scriptures daily. This isn't a, a one-time event. They were regularly searching the scriptures to make sure what, what Paul was saying was true. And this again, this is something we should all be doing. When your pastor's preaching, even when I'm doing what I'm doing here, or whatever you're hearing online, sermons, search the scriptures to see if it's true. Be a Berean, because ultimately God's word is the final word. You know, hopefully, you know, the people around you and the, the voices you're listening to are good voices and are, are leading you to the truth. But back it up with scripture. Look through the scripture to make sure it's it's lining up with the voices you're hearing. And again, like I said in Bible 100, take things in context. Um, that's another another thing you want to do with being a Berean. I think that's part, part of being a Berean is taking the word and, and making sure it's backed up with the speaker, what the speaker said, and it's in context. So again, be a Berean. Make that a habit. So, on to our first characteristic. Our first characteristic is actually pretty, pretty a pretty simple idea on the surface. And that's that God is which means he simply exists, he's real, he's an actual entity, he's the reason behind everything we know, everything we can taste, smell, touch, um, all of creation, you know, the heavens, outer space, uh, the, deep, the deep oceans, he is the reason behind everything. Um, so we're gonna dig through scripture and the first place we're gonna go is actually the beginning of the Bible. The very opening verse in the Bible, Genesis 1, chapter chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, that's in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't evolution. It wasn't aliens. It was God who created the the heavens and the earth. And we'll talk about evolution much, much later. But as far as scripture says, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, so we're going to jump next to John 1, 1. So John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. Now this is introducing the character and the person of Jesus Christ. And we'll get into the Godhead and things like that later. Um, but this echoes what Genesis 1.1 says. And this is in the New Testament. So again, this is echoing what happens in Genesis. Where right? in the beginning was the Word, being Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So there was... He is the start of it. He's the beginning of it. And let's jump down, down to Colossians 1.17 next. Uh, we'll start at verse 15 and we'll jump down through to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And verse 17 really kind of puts it all together. He is before all things, and in him all things consist, in that without God, nothing works. It, everything would fall apart. You know, all the systems, uh, I don't want to get to the science of it all, but all the, the, the science and the, the systems at work in keeping our uni universe existing and keeping us alive and everything else, it's because of God. Um, and then again, in, in the verse 15 and 16, we're touching on the personhood of Jesus Christ again, where he is kind of the manifesting power behind it all. Um, but again, God is. He actually exists. And on that same topic, I want to talk about uh, what is kind of called theism or deism. And it's the idea that God created the universe and he kind of kicked us off to the side and said, guys, you know, good luck. If you make it back to me, that's cool. If you don't, that's cool. Kind of do whatever you kind of want to do. I'm going to be over here. You can do your thing over there. Yeah, you know, there's no, there's no personal interaction. Now, God's a very much a part, a personal, personally involved in creation. He, he's not this entity that's, that doesn't care about us. And to show that we're going to jump to, um, we're going to jump to Genesis chapter two, 18 through 20. And this is God's created creation and he's created man. So we're going to start here. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. So here, God, again, is very much involved in his creation. He didn't create everything, create man, and just say, hey, good luck. He actually gave Adam a task. He gave him a job, and his, his job was to name the animals. And the purpose behind this was there was a male and a female of every animal, and God did not yet create the woman. He wanted Adam to realize, use his intellect, to realize, hey, you know, I don't have one of those. I don't have an, uh, a helper for me. I don't have an other part. Um, so that's what God was using by showing him the animals. But this is to prove the point that God is involved with this. And he gave Adam and Eve more um, more tasks. They were to take care of the garden. And then as, as we go on and on throughout scripture, we can see that God's involved. He's talking to creation. He's leading us through this entire uh, lifespan um, of, of mankind. He's, he's walking with us the entire way. Despite all the stuff we've done, he's still walking with us through this entire process. So, yes, God is. He's real. He's an entity. He, he's the reason we have uh, life. He is the reason everything works. And he's a real, actual entity. That's going to bring us to the next characteristics of God. And that's what I like to call the omnis. And these are characteristics that God and only God possesses. No one else can possess these characteristics. And these three characteristics are omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. And I'll give a definition for each. Omnipresent is to be present in all places at all times. In other words, he's everywhere. You can't play hide and seek from God. Um, omnipotent, having virtually unlimited authority or influence, or one who has unlimited power or authority. 
So there's nothing outside that God can't do. He is, his will will be established. There's no one that can, who can overpower or, um, or do anything that God can't do. And the last is omniscient, which is having infinite awareness, understanding, and insight possessing or possessed of universal or complete knowledge, which means he knows absolutely everything. So with these omnis, God is in complete control. He knows everything. He's everywhere and he's all powerful. There is nothing that we can do that that is outside of his knowledge. Um, we can't usurp him. Um, and this sort of gets into the question of, well, if he's all powerful, all knowing and everything else, then how can the devil do what he did? How can he be so powerful? And that kind of just a real quick blurb that kind of gets into Genesis three and the fall and mankind kind of gave up some of our dominion, a lot of our dominion to the devil with the fall. But we'll get into that later. Um, but God is still over everything, which we'll get into sovereignty in a little bit. So going along with God's omnis, Psalm 139, 4. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So he, he knows everything, even before there's a word on our tongue. He, he can read our mind. He knows what we're thinking. He can read our hearts. Even when we can't read our hearts, he can read our hearts. And the next one's a little, can be a little odd, um, but I kind of like it. And that's Matthew 10, 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. This one is, I don't know about you. I can't number the hairs on my head. I don't even have all my hair anymore. And I'm not going to try to number them. Be a waste of time. You could, I guess, if you, if you really, really wanted to. It's a complete waste of time, complete waste of energy. But without a drop, of a hat at the drop of a hat without any effort God can number all the hairs on our head he knows everything about us and Isaiah 46 9 and 10 remember the former things of old for I am God and there is no other I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And going along with this and the omnis, it's interesting in, in verse 10, he says he can see the, the end from the beginning and that time, God is outside time and space. Time and space are these constructs designed for us where we're kind of confined to our calendars of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and space as, to, as far as like, you know, here and there, you know, say America and Japan and Europe and Antarctica, God's outside time and space. Those are, those are again, constructs designed for us so we can make sense of the world and so things are predictable. Um, but for God, he's, he's outside of these things, which again, goes towards his omnis. Um, and the reason why he can he can be so expansive and so thoughtful in everything he does. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we burn through or go through his characteristics. So again, that's God's omnis. Along this same vein is that God is spirit, meaning that he is, he's invisible, he's infinite. God is not confined by a physical body like we are. And this is partly the reason he can be these omnis, because with us, our, us human beings, we are, again, we're confined by this, this body. So there's only one place I can really be because I can't take this flesh. It, it doesn't, it's confined by time and space. Um, so I can't be here and in, in Japan at the same time. It's physically impossible. Um, and also with that, I, there's only limited strength I can have. And um, you know, so I'm confined by this body, but with God, he is not confined by anything because he is primarily spirit. 
And we're going to jump down to John 4, 24 um, to talk about um, God being spirit and infinite. John 4, 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And then we're going to also jump back to Colossians 1, 15, which we were at earlier. Where in verse 15, it says he is the image. Speaking of Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus is the, the personification of the invisible God because God being spirit can't be viewed. He's not he's not a physical entity. Um, again, what that's the reason he can ha he can have the omnis. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the, the the weaving of Jesus and God too much. Not yet. We'll get there eventually. But God is primarily spirit. That's how he operates. And again, that's why he can he can be and do the things he can. And scripture will talk about God in in human terms. So it'll talk about his hands and his face and it'll talk about him as he has a body. And that's prim primarily because that's how we think. That's how we how we facilitate um, and understand you know, God, because um, us being made in the image of God, he uses that image to talk about himself and things he can do. But again, he is primarily spirit. He is a spirit being. So with that, we're going to talk to, we're going to get to the next um, characteristic. And this is, I want to say a little controversial given, you know, modern day. God is male. He talks about himself as a male. Um, all the angels are males. Jesus was, is a male. And that's just the way it is. God is not a woman. Um, that, that's not to put women down at all. But God speaks of his, as himself as a male. And the reason for that is God created a, a certain hierarchy, an order in creation. And that males were the leaders of society. And God and Jesus being the ultimate leader in society, they are males. And again, that's not to say that women are lesser individuals or subhuman. That's not it at all. And Jesus actually, he actually elevated the position, the view of, of women uh, dramatically in his ministry, um, which we'll get into that. Again, that's something we'll get into later. But God is male that does not put down women at all it's just the way he created order of creation so that's just um that's just you know that's who he is i know in our modern you know feminist uh, this the feminist movement in this the world we live in there is this this put down of men and masculinity and i'll just i'll put it out there there have been plenty of men and women who've done terrible things all throughout creation, all throughout history. And it's easy to, to take a small group or um, someone who gets a lot of exposure and kind of put that on a larger group. For instance, it's it's always the bad guys who get the press. You know, when the camera's pointed out, when the news comes on, Who's getting who's who's the news talking about? It's talking about the bad guy, the guy who did this this thing. He's getting all the attention. It's rare that you'll see a good, upstanding, righteous individual get a new segment, and it's all over the place. It just doesn't happen. That's all throughout history. We're always talking about. We're always almost looking at. These, these bad guys who did these terrible things. And a lot of times they are men. And again, sometimes they are women. Um, but that does not take away from masculinity as being a positive thing. Just want to throw that out there. Get that out there. Um, so we're going to move on to the next characteristic. And that is that God is sovereign. Now, I'm going to give a definition of sovereignty. Sovereign is one possessing or held to possess supreme political power or sovereignty. Now, I like to think of this, the easiest way I think of this is back in the, the kind of the feudal days, back in, you know, medieval times, 
you had these these monarchies who who led you know countries for years and years and years and years so for instance the king of france um, is sovereign over the country of france so the king and the queen and usually it's a whole kind of family they're sovereign over the, the country of france and they kind of they know everything that's going on in france they're in control of everything that's going on within the borders of france uh, and they again they control that place he's not sovereign the king of france is not sovereign over england there's a separate king over there but that just gives the idea of sovereignty where he has the king of france has control has um reign over the country of france what he says goes essentially the same thing with god if we transpose that and take it to a larger context current context god is sovereign over all creation he is just because of his again because of his omnis going back to that a little bit he has control over all of creation so let's jump directly in this scripture to see what it says about his sovereignty so first chronicles 29 11 yours O lord is the greatness the power and the glory the victory and the majesty for all that it is in heaven and in earth is yours yours is the kingdom O lord and you are exalted as head over all both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all in your hand is power and might in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all so again this kind of lays out god's sovereignty where he can he can do everything he wants to do his in his hand is power and might and this this again is over all of creation let's keep on jumping down to job 42 2. job 42 2. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. So again, God can do everything. Um, Proverbs 19, 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. So this is talking about man's plans in his heart. But no matter what anyone plans, the Lord's counsel will stand. And there's plenty of examples of this throughout history. Um, I'll give one quick one. Uh, Voltaire, who was an atheist and really didn't like the church. And he made this statement. He's saying that, you know, in 100 years, the Bible won't exist. Something of that sort. I'm paraphrasing. But it's funny, God has a sense of humor in that Voltaire's house, actually, after he died, became a printing press of the Bible. They were actually printing the Bible from his household. Uh, so it's funny in a way. Again, God has a sense of humor. But God's counsel will stand. His word's going to stand. It's been standing for years and years and years. And man has been trying to get rid of it for years and years and years. Never works. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Now we're going to jump down next to Psalm 103:39. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That just kind of goes without saying. So we're going to jump down next to Psalm 135:6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deep places. So his sovereignty goes from heaven down to earth um, in all the deep places. And again, kind of uh, begs the question about, you know, how could he do what he did, you know, in heaven? Um, but God is sovereign and there is a plan behind all of it. I can't extrapolate it all right now, but God is sovereign everywhere over everyone, even the demons, even Satan, um, and especially over us who are kind of restricted into this quote unquote lower heaven. Um, but that's just touching the surface on God's sovereignty. The next 
characteristic of God is what I like to say is his primary attribute. And that is God's holiness. And to give an example of holiness, I like to think of it as a t-shirt or a house. For instance, you have this white, spanking clean white t-shirt. It's completely spotless. It's holy. Same thing with a house. Say you have a house that's completely clean. There's no dust in it. There's no mosquitoes. There's no, no dog hair. There is nothing. This house is completely spotless. It's holy, completely holy. Now, the minute a drop of dust, a dog hair, anything gets in that on that t-shirt or in that house, it no longer becomes holy. And this is the, the main chasm, the main separation point between us and God is that he is holy and we are not. And that's the whole reason for Christ bridging that gap between the two. But that's what holiness is. It's kind of, it's this completely pure, you know, I say white as in cleanliness place. Um, so God has to remain holy. So let's jump into scripture to see what it says about God's holiness. We're going to go to Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Uh, we're going to just run through these real quick. 1 Samuel 2, 2. No one is holy like the Lord. For there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Psalm 22, 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. If we want to keep on running through these, these are just kind of to prove God's holiness. Scripture has tons to say about his holiness. As we'll see in here in Isaiah, in Isaiah 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in this, they're, they're not once, not twice, but three times, they're saying God is holy. And a lot of times when scripture says something more than once or twice or three times, it's kind of hammering at home. You know, holy, holy, holy. God is definitively holy. Um, so that's Isaiah 3, 6, 3. We're going to jump down to Isaiah 43, 15 next. I am the Lord God, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Luke 1, 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. First uh, Peter 1, 16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. It's one I love. It's referencing, you know, Leviticus in the Old Testament. Um, and last but not least, talking about his holiness, uh, Revelations 4.18. This is um, the end of the Bible. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, holy. Holy, holy, Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Again, they're, they're singing this day and night about God's holiness because he is so holy. They just, they can't stop singing about it. So this is, again, scratching the surface along with the rest of these, um, scratching the surface about God's holiness. Our next characteristic is... God is just. And this is not controversial. It's just different. It's juxtaposed to our current world. God is just in that he is impartial. He doesn't look at wealth, status, if you're famous, and his, and his justice and his view of us. Which, again, is juxtaposed completely to our justice system here in current day. 
and I'm speaking in terms of America in you know the year 2022, um, and probably throughout the, most of the, the modern world, justice systems are pretty broken. Um, our systems are very corrupt. You know, judges have been bribed. Um, if you have money and wealth and fame, you typically get a slap on a wrist or you get nothing at all. And it really ruins the whole idea of justice as a whole. But God is just and he'll get his proper justice. Let's jump into scripture to see about what he says about proper justice. We're going to go to Leviticus 19.15 first. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you should shall judge your neighbor. So again, this is juxtaposed. Do not be impartial to the poor or honor the person of the mighty. Which again, that's something we very much see in our modern society. Proverbs 21, 15. It is a joy for the just to do justice but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Proverbs 24, 23, and 25. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse. Nations will abhor him, but those who rebuke the wicked will have delight in a good blessing will come upon them. And last, we'll touch on Ecclesiastes 8.11. And I love this one. Let me read it first. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And the reason I kind of love this is because we kind of, we see this. In society it's it's a very easy thing to witness when someone does a crime and you know they're, they're not executed the the judgment isn't executed speedily or it's not executed at all what happens is people are looking they're looking at this crime and the the, the justice system and saying hey you know is that person gonna get judged you know he stole something and you know he didn't get caught well, you know, maybe I can do it and not get caught. Then another person looks at it and says, hey, these guys didn't get caught. And on and on it goes. And what ends up happening is the entire justice system standard goes down and down and down as no one execu is executed or no one's executed speedily with their judgments. And again, this is something we see in our society where the more and more corruption and evil and just wickedness, wickedness goes on, just society goes down and down and down and become more and more wicked. And it's like, it's like at the end of, I think it's the book of First Kings. Let me find it. Hold on a second. Sorry, I found it. It's at the, the end of the book of Judges. And this is, this goes along exactly with improper judgment and kind of Ecclesiastes when, when justice isn't executed speedily. Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. There was no judge. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Again, we see that happening right now. Everyone does what they want to do because there's no judge. You know, no one's saying, don't do this. There's no, there's no standard. So everyone just willy-nilly does whatever feels good to them. Um, and again, this isn't how God created or wanted creation to be. He wants creation to be properly judged. And at the end of everything, again, we don't see this, we don't see judgment, proper judgment. Sometimes we see it here on earth. But at the end of it all, God's going to get proper judgment. And he's going to judge everyone according to the works. He doesn't care if you're rich, if you're a billionaire. He doesn't care if you've made a whole bunch of Hollywood movies and everyone knows you and loves you. He doesn't care if you're a king of this country or you're a president of this country. He's going to judge you based upon your heart, your works. You can't walk, talk, 
You know, you can't work your way out of it. Um, everyone will get judged at the end of time. Um, it's kind of a shame we can't see more of that here, but uh, if you look through scripture, especially through Revelation and the Great White Throne Judgment, everyone gets judged. That judgment will be completely impartial and God's going to get his due. Um, so that's just talking about that. So the next characteristic is God's love. And talking about love, what God's love isn't is what is so popular in our culture today. Love, kind of in the, the Hebrew term, depending on which version of kind of love you're talking about, love connotates or kind of implies an action. It's like when, when you say biblical love, it implies there's an action behind it. It's not just this feel good, this butterflies in your stomach, this warm, fuzzy feeling of, oh, I love you now. No, it's not that. It implies commitment. It implies a backing, if you will, um, when God says, when God's talking about love. Kind of the same thing in marriage. It's, it's kind of this commitment. So when God says he loves mankind, he's committed to mankind. Despite everything we've done and we're doing current day, he's still committed to us. He still, he still loves us despite all of that. Um, so that is actual biblical love. Uh, so we're going to jump into scripture. We're going to read First uh, John 4, 7 through 11. Just this whole kind of um, this long paragraph of about love. So First John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God and everyone who loves God, who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Now, in that paragraph, there's a lot of talk about love. And even I could keep on going on throughout um, just First John 4 right here. And there's more talk about love, much less the, 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 the whole book of John itself and scripture itself talks about God's love. And again, God's love is characteristic characterized by an action in that God's love sent his son for us for the propitiation for our sins it wasn't just this lovey-dovey feeling oh I love you and no he he sent his son action oriented because he loved us despite the fact that we didn't love him um, so that's God's love in a nutshell and this will get extrapolated much, much more as we go on. But that's God's love. It's not the world's love. Very, very different. You have to kind of get that. Once you understand that and get that, it makes a lot of sense. So next, we're going to move into God's mercy and grace. And this is mercy, grace, and patience, um, and love, and justice are kind of this... This weird package. That's how I think of it anyways. This weird package of how can God be merciful and graceful and just at the same time? Because sometimes those almost seem like an oxymoron in my mind. Um, but again, we're limited beings um, and talking about limited beings and just the difference of God and us. Let's jump to scripture real quick. Isaiah 55, 9 for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I, I like to remind myself of this because sometimes we try to take God, we try to squeeze him into human convention, squeeze him into human thinking in terms of if this doesn't work for us, if that's not how we think, it doesn't work. But that's, that's just not, God is way outside of us outside of time, outside of space. 
um, to, to be able to do all these things. He can see the end from the beginning. He's not confined by space and time, kind of going back to his omnis. That is how he can be merciful and graceful and just because he, he can see our lives in an instant to be able to do all that, to, to work all that mercy and grace. So let's jump in the scripture to see about his mercy and his grace. We're going to go to Psalm 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. This is kind of a, this is, this verse here is packing in a lot because he's full of compassion, love, gracious grace long suffering which is patient he's abundant in mercy and truth this is this large package of things just within this verse uh, so we're going to jump next to ephesians 2 4 through 5. so ephesians 2 4 through i'm going to read through actually through 9. but god who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, selves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, this is, I love in, in verse four, it says he, he's rich in mercy and because of his great love with which he loved us. And it's going late, later down, his kindness towards us, by grace you have been saved. It is the gift of God. He, again, it's this, package deal that God can be and do because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our, our thoughts and being outside of time and space with the omnis. Again, this is this is whole package of who God is and this is the reason why he can do these things. And again, if you try to squeeze God down into this human convention, down into human thinking, our human mind, our human flesh, none of this works because we can't do all that thing, all those things. We can hardly we can hardly remember what happened yesterday, much less predict what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, um, and we're we can't read people's hearts. We can't read people's minds. Uh, these are things that God can do um, that we can't do. So it's just, um, yeah, can't squeeze him down in the human convention, human thinking. Let's jump down next to God's patience. We're going to jump down to Psalm 86, 15, which we were just here. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Again, that, that term long-suffering is patience. Let's jump down next to Romans 2, 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, patience, not knowing that the goodness of God lead you to repent repentance again kind of going back what i said earlier about god's loving creation and his patience for us he's been patient with mankind for six thousand years and the reason for his patience is he wants to lead us to repentance repentance both kind of corporately and kind of individually or definitely definitely individually god wants everyone to be saved he wants everyone to come to repentance. But that's a decision you all, everyone has to make on their own. No one, it can't be forced upon you. It's, it's something you have to come to on your own. But that's what God's patience is over these last 6,000 years or so. It's it's God being patient, showing us love, kindness, grace, and walking us through creation. Again, he's involved, he's personally there, walking us through so that we can get, we can get rep repentance and that we can live eternally with him. That's the reason for his patience. That's the reason for his grace and his mercy. It's because he, he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. 
that is the entire purpose and the reason behind it. I got one more verse. We're going to jump down to 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long, su long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, that, but that all should come to repentance. Goes along with Romans 2, 4. His patience is so that everyone should come to repentance, so that everyone can be saved. That is the reason for his suffering. And there's a another side to that. There's wrath and there is judgment. Um, you see that in Revelation. You see When we've seen that in other places, you've seen it in uh, Saddam and Gomorrah. We've seen it in, um, in Noah and the flood. Um, so there is that aspect to it also. Um, but God wants everyone to be saved. And he gives everyone ample time and ample chances. Again, we can we tend to think, oh, you know, God's mean because of this, because of that. Again, we're confined by our space, our time, our thinking. We can't read people's hearts. We can't see the timeline of humanity, much less, you know, humanity as a whole, much less an individual's um, timeline to make proper judgments. But God can. And again, that's the reason he's patient and he's loving and he's merciful in truth and he's sovereign and why he has the omnis. Because there's this entire package of that's who God is. And that's what he wants from us. That's, I mean, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Um, to kind of break it down. And I won't go too long, too far. This video could be easily, like, easily four hours if I spent more time in scriptures. But this is just scratching the surface of God's personality. Who God is. And we'll dig more into it the more we go on. But again, God wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. That's the reason for some of his characteristics. And going back to his, his character, God created man in his image. So we can possess most of his characteristics. Now we can't possess the omnis. Like I said, those are things that he possesses and only he possesses. But we can possess his love. We can possess um, his mercy, his grace, his his patience. Um, his his uh, we can we can possess all those characteristics, and you can even see this in people who don't follow God, because all of mankind, every man and woman, is made in the image of God. They are capable of possessing and showing all those characteristics. So some of the most wicked people in the world can still show God's love. They can still show his patience. They can show even sometimes even his truth, even in their wickedness, because we're all made in the image of God. So we should be striving and looking for looking forward to and trying to possess those characteristics of God. But don't forget. We're all made in the image of God. We all can possess these characteristics. So that's it for God 100. Been a pleasure. Again, we could have spent a lot more time into this, but I just wanted to scratch the surface, get the conversation about who God is. So I'll see you in the next episode. God bless.